All right, so now what we're going to do is talk about how proteins fold. So how proteins fold and how they change. Because one thing that's important to understand about protein structure is th that it's in an aqueous environment. And just like if you were to drop, I don't know, like a, a hair or I don't know, anything into a glass of water or something like that, it's going to be mobile, it's going to move. I mean, think of yourself in a swimming pool you respond to the water and the water responds to you. Um, you're not just super rigid in there. Um, so protein structures are kind of breathing entities. There can be local fluctuations as well as global unfolding. So the entire tertiary structure can be completely unfolded based on the, depending on the environment. Um, so studies of local fluctuations tend to show that peptide backbone areas not in stable secondary structures show high fluctuations. With every secondary structure or within every secondary structure, there are varying degrees of fluctuations. So what that means is, say an alpha helix might be 10 amino acids and then might expand to 11 or 12 or 13 depending on, well, not necessarily anything in specific or in particular, but it's entirely possible that it could happen. Alpha helices tend to fray at their termini. So it might be 10 and then 11 and 12 on each end might be a part of the helix and then might not be a part of the helix depending on the environment or some, some sort of subtle change. Beta sheets are generally more stable than or in the center of a protein and then the center of a beta sheet than the ends of a beta sheet. The most stable areas of the structure are the same areas that act as the folding nucleation sites. So those areas that initiate or kind of cause the rest of the protein to fold. Now, the primary sequence contains all of the important information that a protein needs to adopt its tertiary and quaternary structure or its native structure, its native fold. So here's kind of a snapshot of what happens in a cell. We have a mRNA transcript that has been produced from genomic DNA. And then we have this thing called the ribosome where an mRNA is going to go. And at the ribosome, there are different spots or different locations where a tRNA is going to be attracted. That tRNA has what's known as an anticodon, and that aligns with a codon that is found on an mRNA. Now, that tRNA is going to begin assembling, those tRNAs are going to begin assembling a growing polypeptide chain of amino acids at that ribosome. And we'll process this mRNA, causing this polypeptide chain to grow longer and longer. Now, the native structure is generally only slightly more stable than the unfolded structure of a protein. We have approximately 0.4 kilojoules per mole per amino acid. That number is not something that I'm going to be really alluding to any more than just showing it right here. Weak non-covalent interactions along with covalent crosslinks like disulfide bonds stabilize the native structure of a protein. But how does a protein fold? from a linear chain to a native structure. Well, protein folding pathways, how does something go from this at the, the bottom of the screen to something like this, this 3D globular thing? Well, what are those driving forces? There's this theory or this Leventhal paradox that if a polypeptide chain search every possible confirmation on its path to its native tertiary structure, it would take longer than the apparent age of the universe ultimately to fold. So a protein doesn't get folded and then contort itself into all of the different possible permutations uh, because it would take too long. Proteins can fold and reach their native structure on the millisecond time scale. So how do they get from the primary sequence to the tertiary and the quaternary structure? Well, the ideas that have been presented, model A, folding is hierarchical, in which you have local structures form, and then those local structures lead to um, 
folding of the tertiary structure. Okay, pretty good idea. Let's get the let's get small areas in in case, and let's get lots of small areas in in place, and then we'll have the the three D structure. Perfect. Another theory would be or is that basically the most hydrophobic regions of the protein are going to aggregate together. And as they aggregate together, they'll kind of like force, or they'll be forced together and then the rest of the protein will fold in its, its necessary position. And in reality, it's a combination of the two. So you do have this hydrophobic collapse, but you also have simultaneously secondary structural, secondary structures forming. Now, a way to study a protein is by studying, excuse me, it in its folded, yeah, its folded shape as well as in its unfolded shape. There's only one single or there's only one uh, native structure of protein, but there is not one denatured structure. These, um, it's it's more common to call the denatured state a random coil. Um, many different proteins exhibit a two-folded or a two-state folding process, either folded or unfolded. It's generally going to be easier to study how a protein folds or denatures. The loss of that structure is generally what's going to result in a loss of function. So I want to draw your attention to this, this graph at the bottom here. And what we have here is a range from a protein being completely folded to being completely unfolded. And so our y-axis is concentration or percentage of a protein um, unfolded. And so on the that's on our y-axis. Our x-axis is the addition of a denaturant. Now there's a bunch of different denaturants. One common one is urea. And then there's also guanidinium, guan uh, dinium, hydrochloride or HCl, GN, HCl is what it's commonly known as, um, or GDN, HCl. The addition of these is going to, you know, a protein's going to resist low concentrations, but then at some point a high enough concentration is going to cause that protein to unfold fairly rapidly. And then you can study that protein in its fully denatured state. But what's cool about that is something that we're going to get to in just a little while when we talk about a, a very important scientist uh, along this line. So our denaturants, you know, you have your non-covalent interactions that are generally weak. Disruptions of those non-covalent interactions cause the protein to, to denature. Heat can cause that. Salt can cause that. pH can cause that. Detergents like SDS and chaotropic agents like urea and guanidinium chloride or guanidinium hydrochloride. Now, these substances, these chaotropic agents, what they do is they disrupt hydrogen bonds. And so, you know, you have hydrogen bonds that are, are holding a protein together, lots of them. Whenever you disrupt those hydrogen bonds, now that protein's not being, not very well being held together anymore. Um, so, so these components right here will address some parts of a protein or some interactions between side chains. But then this doesn't really get to the point of the disulfide bonds. So disulfide bonds between cysteine residues. These chemical crosslinks between these are, are they are covalent interactions and they are strong and they will constrain the structure of a protein. So those can be reduced with something like dithiothreatol or DTT or beta mercaptoethanol or 2-ME is what it's also known as. There are also enzymes that can do this. Now, a long time ago, I believe it was in the early 50s or late 40s, there was a fellow by the name of Christian Anfinson. And he studied this protein or this enzyme known as ribonuclease A. And let me stress, Christian Anfinson's work was very important because of what he discovered. Um, so Christian Anfinson is a name that you definitely want to know and what he did and the value of it. 
So what he did was he took this enzyme known as ribonuclease A. Ribonuclease A takes RNA molecules and just chops them up. And so he had kind of easily purified active ribonuclease A. And he said, you know what? I'm going to add eight molar urea, eight molar urea and beta mercaptoethanol. And whenever I do that, what I know is going to happen is that eight molar urea is going to disrupt the hydrogen bonds. So urea is a chaotropic agent. And then that beta mercaptoethanol, that's going to break all those disulfide bonds. And so what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a protein that well, it was previously folded properly and was functional. And then the result of that is going to be something that's completely linear and cannot break any disol, or sorry, cannot chomp up any in ribonuclease A. So that's phase one, part one. Oh, 1957, sorry. Um, then what he said was, what if I remove that urea and that beta mercaptoethanol. What happens to my protein? Basically asking the question, can I break this? And then can I unbreak it? Is what he was getting at. And the answer was ultimately, yes. When he was able to dilute out the urea and the beta mercaptoethanol, those two substances, that protein could spontaneously refold. Not only refold, but return to uh, its active state and go about well, catalyzing reactions where it's chomping up RNA molecules. So the significance of this was, this is like an early stage of, if you've got the primary structure, you can get the tertiary structure. If you've got the primary structure, you have all the information to get that folded structure because there's no, there's no like magic sauce that, a protein, whatever it's synthesized, then gets so that it can fold properly. Instead, that primary sequence is adequate information to get the tertiary sequence out of it. Now, the thermodynamics of protein folding, thanks to Christian Infanson's work, showed that protein folding is a physical process that depends on amino acid sequence and the solvent. Now, what that did was it gave people who are very smart and understand thermodynamics to a great extent, it gave them a lot of confidence and said that, well, you can understand protein folding from this energetic perspective. The folded or native structure should have the global minimum free energy. So that, that structure is ultimately what we're looking for. Now, that was all done in vitro. Protein folding in vivo is a different story. Um, Protein folding conditions in a cell are slightly different than the controlled system that someone like Christian Anfinson worked on. Now that redox environment in a cell can be quite a bit different. What that means is that sometimes things happen and it's not what the cell wants or needs. Sometimes the wrong disulfide bond is formed. And so how does a cell or how does an organism respond to that? Well, there's an enzyme known as disulfide isomerase, also known as PDI. And a cell will use that when the wrong disulfide bond is formed. It's going to reduce a disulfide bond and then it's going to reoxidize the disulfide bond. So here what we have is a model that shows uh, the upper portion where we've got a non-native disulfide bond that's formed, or a pair of them, and PDI comes in. Oop. breaks up the disulfide bond, then enables the proper disulfide bond to form and subsequent other proper disulfide bond to form. And that's where we get. We get our, our correct disulfide bonds formed. Um, and so there are enzymes that basically compensate when the wrong disulfide bond is formed. There are also a class of enzymes known as chaperones. Um, and there's just this one chaperone that I want you to be familiar with, and that's the structure shown over on the right, upper right-hand corner of the slide. It's this guy right here. It's, this is just two different views of it. 
Um, chaperones bind unfolded and partially folded polypeptide chains and basically kind of they put them into an environment that makes it much for more uh, favorable for them to fold. So uh, molecular chaperones can also capture misfolded proteins, just like what we saw in the previous slide of the wrong disulfide bond being formed. Sometimes proteins aren't folded properly. And whenever that happens, a protein like a chaperone will take those on and basically correct it. Now, there are two classes that have been very, very well classified or very well characterized. Those are your heat shock proteins, heat shock proteins, HSP, 70 family, and then the chaperonins. Now, this protein right here, this protein complex is a the grow, also known as the grow ELES complex. Now, what this protein is going to do is I always kind of think about it as it's like a, a trash can where it is open. And whenever it is open, there is a junk protein represented by that purple structure there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. When the trash can's open, that purple protein gets dropped into the trash can. And then this grow ES cap comes along and is placed on top of it. Now, what has already happened is that this protein complex is bound ATP. It's bound a grand total of seven ATP. Because what it's going to do is it's going to hydrolyze those seven ATP to ultimately refold that previous junk protein into the properly folded version of itself. Still is bound to ADP, has this newly properly folded protein present. And then what it's going to be able to do is it's going to be able to bind another junk protein. When it binds that junk protein, it's also going to bind 7-ATP. Here's our junk protein at the bottom. Here's the 7-ATP ATP that it bound, and then the ADP that's still in place. The improved full, yeah, the improved folded protein is going to be released. The refolded protein is released, and our garbage can cap is going to be released. Then the protein's going to undergo this 180 degree rotation. So what I want you to take away from this is that the grow ELES complex kind of remediates or refolds improperly folded proteins, and it does it in an ATP dependent manner. This protein complex is very important for the overall health of a cell, because if a protein isn't folded properly, well then it's not going to function properly. Grow ELES complex and all your other chaperones help avoid that by refolding misfolded proteins. Um, there are many folding pathways that require some sort of special isomerization, whether that's refolding or uh, reorganization of disulfide bonds. It happens. Cells make mistakes very rarely, um, but when they do, they're able to correct them. Now, here's kind of a, uh, a flow of how things can go wrong. Um, there's a number of different protein folding diseases, and those folding diseases are generally whenever a protein doesn't fold properly. So here in the upper left-hand corner, we've got a newly synthesized polypeptide. If it folds properly, it goes to its native state, check mark. It can go on and do whatever it needs to do. It's in a good position though. Alternatively, if it is not folded properly, what can be the fate of that misfolded protein? That misfolded protein can be refolded and go to the native stru structure, as is the case with like what the grow ELES complex is doing. Remember the grow ELES complex is an ATP dependent protein refolder. So when it refolds a protein, that protein can go on a native structure, do its job, it's good. However, there are some instances where a misfolded protein doesn't get refolded. 
Now, one thing that the cell can do is it can degrade those. That's generally going to be a good thing. Um, but there are other instances where that misfolded protein is going to aggregate with other misfolded proteins, perhaps other versions of itself, in which case this aggregation of these proteins can be very dramatic and can be potentially fatal um, because basically these cells are taking up or these proteins are taking up resources. They're kind of clogging up the system and the cell doesn't have anything to do deal with there or it doesn't have any way of uh, kind of processing and compensating for that. Now, I think lots of people are fairly familiar with uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is known for the amyloid beta protein or a beta protein and that's the protein that's defective and it's these peptides that lead to the formation of the or these aggregations of these peptides that lead to plaques that form and ultimately neuronal cells and other cells begin to die uh and so these are all examples of uh misfolding diseases and it's it's a and yeah, in many cases, these are fatal. Sometimes it's very slow. Sometimes it's a little bit faster. Um, and yeah, these I think that these are all things that people are fairly familiar, fairly familiar with. Um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, amylotrophic lateral sclerosis or Huntington's disease, where the protein Huntington is uh, misfolded. And ultimately, that's something that people are born with. And um, I think life expectancy is in the 30s with that. Um, but yeah, these are um, very, very tragic cases. And I hate to conclude with that, but that's that's what we have for the end of protein folding. Um, but as you can imagine, understanding protein folding mechanisms is essential for treatment of these diseases. Um, is there a way to, is there a therapy that can lead to the proper refolding of protein or something like that? These are all avenues of research. All right. Well, I hope this is helpful and I hope you have a good afternoon or a good day. Bye-bye.